All right, and then I think we should be All right. good Start to go. Here. And I was going to let you introduce yourself. All right. <laughs> so yeah, that's exactly what all my slides are here to begin with. <laughs> is uh, my name is Stan Yan. I'm author and illustrator. In my introduction, I title A Portrait of Fear uh, for a reason that you will find out soon. I'm the author of uh, There's a Zombie in the Basement, which is uh, my uh, first children's picture book. I'll pass that around. As well as a bunch of different comic books like this one here. Um, they're all, they're all zombie related here. <laughs> um, but uh, let's see here. Oops. And so, um, and, and I do um, caricatures as well. So I don't know, uh, you guys are all familiar with what a caricature is, right? I just happen to do zombie versions of them at places like Denver Pop Culture Con. I don't know if I'm going to be there this year or not. Uh, San Diego Comic Con. Oh, yes? Yeah. Well, great. Um, so anyway, um, but I didn't just get there all of a sudden. I mean, it, it was kind of a long road, and it actually started uh, right around the picture, the, the time that this picture was taken, actually a couple of years before this. But uh, this was probably my most embarrassing school photo, so... I clearly had to use that. Um, so right around the time that, um, let's see, where am I? Um, oh, oh, actually, uh, because I'm not using my presenter's notes, I'm like, oh, where am I in this pre presentation? <laughs> so anyway, uh, as I was growing up, or around the time of this picture, I was drawing the same characters over and over again, doing different things in these boxes that uh, I later found out were called, called ca comic panels. Uh, so I was doing comics before I realized that that's what I was doing. So clearly, that's been my muse since I was a little child. And those were my earliest memories. But I didn't really take a lot of pride in my artwork. In fact, my art looked a little bit like this at the time. But that didn't matter. I had, for me, the most important thing was to tell a story. You know, and if I took too much time to draw a picture, that I was never going to get through the story to finish it before dinner so I could show my parents or whatever. And uh, but fortunately for me, my dad worked at a company that threw away reams and reams of computer printouts. So he'd just bring some of those home, so I always had something to write on or draw on. Um, probably with, you know, uh, company secrets on the other side, but I didn't care. Um, all I cared about was uh, if I wasn't doing anything else, I'd be drawing. And uh, so I got a lot of practice. Whoops. Oh, I didn't want to get to the Casa Bonita thing yet. <laughs> so um, around the time of the picture in the previous slide, um, my uh, aunt came into town on her wedding honeymoon. And, uh, you know, um, if you've got out-of-town guests, you got to take them to Casa Bonita, and hopefully we'll be able to do that again here very soon. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> hopefully. Um, so how many of you, uh, have you all been to Casa Bonita in your lives? Okay. For, uh, I saw one uh, no, um, uh, nod, no. <laughs> so... So, um, for those of you that haven't been there, uh, it's, it's like an amusement park in a restaurant. Um, and one of the things that you have in amusement parks often is the caricature booth, right? And uh, even at that age, I was about seven years old, um, I'd been watching character artists intently, you know. I had already figured out that character artists had their... Um, uh, what do you call it, um, kind of their signature style, so to speak. Sometimes that signature style was built around their inability to draw a certain part of your facial anatomy, so they would like draw everyone's noses the same or, or something. But, uh, or it was something that they thought was funny, so they'd draw every drawing the same way. 
Uh, so this particular character artist drew everyone with their eyes touching in the middle, and they drew everyone with buck teeth. And so when my aunt bought us all caricatures, um, you know, she she didn't really appreciate the fact that she was drawn with buck teeth. She thought it was a awful racial stereotype. <laughs> now, my new uncle, he's a creative type as well. Uh, he was a musician. And um, we creative types tend to back each other, but uh, this was not the time to uh, defend the character artists. I thought they were going to get uh, divorced on their honeymoon over the caricatures. <laughs> so even at that young age, I felt like I wanted to do characters. I could do characters, but at that point, uh, I was afraid of doing characters because I thought, if I, all my customers are like my aunt, I definitely don't want to do caricatures. <laughs> so, hence the portrait of fear. Uh, but my uh, love affair with art continued. In fact, uh, uh, I continued to draw all the way through high school. Um, this is a, a picture that was in our yearbook um, that, I, that I drew and staged for our uh, science department. And, um, uh, but I didn't really consider art to be a viable career path, so I didn't re really even think about going to art school, didn't research it. Um, you know, so uh, I actually, believe it or not, went to uh, the University of Colorado and studied accounting, of all things. <laughs> but I continued to uh, draw my comics on the side. I uh, did uh, editorial comics as well as uh, comic strips for the uh, school paper up at the CU. And uh, I actually ended up spending a whole summer in New York City doing an internship as an art director for an ad agency, which was cool because I got to work with uh, the people that um, uh, created Schoolhouse Rock. And one of the, uh, well, I, I found out after the fact that he was, a, I think, a Silver Age comic book artist, but uh, he also wrote for Sesame Street. He was working as a copywriter in our department as well, so that was pretty cool. Uh, anyway, after I uh, graduated, I actually didn't start uh, working in uh, art. I actually was a stockbroker for about 13 years, but during that time, I uh, self-published my first three comic books and my first graphic novel and start taking them around to comic book conventions to promote them back in uh, 2001. So in fact, my second comic book convention I ever went to to promote myself was uh, the same big San Diego Comic Con. And I've actually had a table there every year since, ever since, other than the last two years where I had a virtual table there. <laughs> they had a virtual convention. Um, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But uh, so anyway, um, about around 2007, I got uh, laid off from my brokerage career. And uh, with the blessing of my wife, I decided I'm going to go ahead and do this full time for a living. But I had to actually figure out how to make money at these conventions, because up until then, I was just worried about building a, um, a following. But I, I'd seen some of my friends doing um, uh, commissions, little sketches for fans to make a few extra bucks. I'm like, well, maybe I can do some fan-based characters, but I was still afraid of what people might think of how I drew them, uh, you know, if they were going to be like my aunt or not. And so I was like, well, maybe I should draw zombie versions of them, and they'll expect to look awful, right? <laughs> and that was a lot of pressure off of me. And so, fortunately for me, the zombie thing started getting really big at that time. And um, I started to get known for that. Well, that and uh, My Little Pony caricatures. <laughs> so my booth assistant convinced me I needed to do something for the kids. And then I actually ended up working an event with someone. And we split a table, our first Denver County Fair. And so I split a table because I had a book that was about geek culture. 
And oh, this one right here. Here, I'll pass it around. And she she had all these like uh, polyhedral dice earrings and necklaces and 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 I'd I'd drawn some of the characters in the book with her jewelry on them and like oh here you know I don't know how this is gonna go. Would you like to? And it was the Geek Pavilion. It's like would you like to share a booth? She's like all right and not realizing that like 90% of her stuff at that point was My Little Pony stuff, like cutie mark buttons and things. So I had all the zombie stuff up and she had all this pony stuff up. And my first commission was to do a uh, My Little Pony zombie <laughs> <laughs> of Twilight Sparkle based on a, uh, a customer's request. And then my booth was, uh, Mate, she she said, "Could you draw me as a pony, not a zombie pony, but just a pony?" I'm like, "All right." And so she she was the one that was like helping me all night. She's promoting that I will I'll draw a, a zombie or a pony of you. I did um, uh, pony characters of uh, Frank Romero. I don't know, do you know him? He's one of the co-founders of the original Denver Comic Con and Dink. Oh. With Charlie LaGreca. Okay. Cool. So anyway, then it started going viral there too, and then, yeah. So that's how this started. <laughs> uh, so one day, everything was going well until my son was not quite uh, four years old, and uh, he wouldn't come down to my basement studio for some reason. And his mom asked him, "Well, what's wrong?" And she, he said, "I'm scared." And she's like, what are you scared of? And he started pointing at all the zombie artwork hanging in my basement. And I, that got me a I told you so look for my wife, who'd been trying to get me to rotate my decor ever since she was pregnant with him. I'm like, nah, if he's exposed to it, he won't be scared of it. And then I found out that uh, I was wrong. <laughs> but that inspired me to write this book. There's a zombie in the basement, my first children's book. And I'm still writing for children to this day, but they're all uh, children's graphic novels. I'm doing this comic strip that uh, appears weekly and a virtual comic page for kids called the Sunday Ha Ha, so called Peter Cadaver, but borrows uh, characters from my children's book. So I kind of re uh, made the zombie girl from my picture book a little younger. And uh, see, even the, the Tapeworm that's in the book is a character as well. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, that is what I do uh, right now, and um, I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about how I got into this because I kind of sped through the last part of this just because I, I created the slideshow quite some time ago. But uh, once once I um, wrote, um, there's a zombie in the basement. I ended up um, joining a, an organization um, called the uh, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, just to figure out what I, if what I was doing was right. And the nice thing about it was I ended up joining a local critique group of other author illustrators. And uh, and you know that helped me to fine tune my book, but I also was able to go to um, like a local conference as well as a lot of uh, local uh, meetups and um, illustrators meetups that had a lot of fantastic information about the industry. Uh, the conference itself um, had uh, kind of like uh, uh, workshops on how to like get an agent, which I, I found out that like you don't just all of a sudden get published by Scholastic or you know Penguin or Random House Graphic. You um, most of those uh, large trade publishers um, have a don't take unsolicited submissions, so you need to actually get a literary agent that will then submit your work and get it through the front door at those um, publishers. So they're, they're kind of like a, 
the gatekeeper, the what key master, they're the gatekeepers, sort of. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, so that was kind of interesting. And one of the other things that they do is they, uh, at the regional, uh, the regional conference, they normally have these intensives on Sunday. So the conference goes until like Sunday at lunch. And then after lunch, you have, um, uh, you know, two and a half to three hour intensives where they really dig in deep into a particular topic. It's a lot of times it's really hands on. So that year we had um, um, a creator um, by the name of Selena Yoon, who is the author and illustrator of uh, like hundreds of books, Penguin and Pinecone, uh, uh, be a Friend, I think is the name of her first actual picture book. She did a lot of board books for um, early readers. And um, anyway, so she uh, taught us how to make our own dummy books that may look like real books. Uh, so, she, you know, because how she broke in the industry is she, she did uh, uh, wrote board books and then actually assembled them in, with foam core and board because a lot of those books have you know moving dials and flaps so she'd actually engineer them so that it wasn't that she was just submitting a proposal that had well this is what it's going to look like she actually submitted something that you could open and interact with that would act just like the finished published product and uh so she's going to teach us how to make those, but she also taught us how to make um, a dummy picture book that looked like a real hardcover book. And so I made one of these for There's a Zombie in the Basement, and I sent a couple of them out to, because uh, at that time you could actually physically send a, sub, uh, a submission to agents and some publishers as well. And that's one of the benefit of going to the conference is a lot of these um, agents and publishers that are not open to unsolicited submissions well kind of they're you know um, uh, they get paid to speak but in exchange they have to accept submissions by conference attendees for at least a limited amount of time you know like a couple of months or something like that so i went ahead and sent a few of these out but then i i kept one and over the next year while I was waiting to hear back on, on uh, all my rejections from all these publishers and agents, I, uh, I would take this one dummy book around to different uh, conventions. And when I was drawing people live in my booth as zombies, they could read this book. And inevitably, you know, most of the people are like, how do I buy this? Or they were like, but didn't you realize there's only like three color pages in there? All the rest of them are just black and white pencil sketches. Um, like, well, it's not available yet. And I'm still, you know, shopping it around. But if you'd like to know when it comes out or if I end up self-publishing it, you know, sign up on my mailing list. By the end of the year, I had 2,000 new people on my mailing list. And people were badgering me about this book. Like, when is it kind of going to come out? When is it going to come out? And actually, I, I mentioned Scholastic before, but the funny uh, story was that I was drawing, um, I don't know if you know Jason Heller? Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So he was, he was at the, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say this because I don't know, because he ghost wrote something for a big Scholastic title. But anyway, it's like, have you submitted this to Scholastic? And I'm like, no, unfortunately, I don't take unsolicited submissions. They're like, well, just between you and me, I'm ghostwriting a particular title, and I can show this to my uh, editor if you want me to. I'm like, oh, yeah. So, so I got it in with Scholastic, and that was the last one I was waiting for. And they finally sent me the rejection letter. And, and most of them really good, because normally you expect to just get form letters. But I would say three quarters of them actually had very specific critique notes on it. And, you know, that's when you know you're on the right track is you, you actually, they spent time to tell you things about how, what they're looking for, why it doesn't work, maybe things that you can do to make things better. And uh, 
But anyway, I was ready to go. I ended up kickstarting. Um, there's a zombie in the basement. And uh, it ended up being a really good thing because I, I think, like, based on all the information that I learned, um, it really helped me. And then when I actually ran the campaign, I was going to go with a Chinese printer. But I don't know if any of you are familiar with Kickstarter or not, but if you run a campaign, inevitably, once you launch your campaign, all of these people come out of the woodwork and try to sell you stuff that will make your campaign better, you know. And one of the people that reached out that I actually bothered to open the message and read was uh, a printer here in the U.S. that said, you know, we'll give you a quote if you want. I'm like, sure, why not? That, that can't hurt. And they, they came in only about $400 above the Chinese printers, but they actually work as a distributor for self-publishers to put your book into Ingram, which, you know, bookstores order out of, which was probably the best decision I ever made. I was like, oh, sure, you can do that. And they do, they do all, a lot of other marketing stuff for free just for using them as a printer. And uh, so uh, long story short, I was able to sell my books uh, through Ingram and get my books into places like the Tattered Cover, who ended up helping be the conduit for pre-orders for school visits, which I'd been already doing as a part of like all of the teaching that I'd been doing up until that point. The summer camps turned into school visits through organizations like the Jewish Community Center, which would send me out to um, promote their summer camp programs, as well as some of the other things that they were doing. Um, and so I already had like all these contacts within all these different schools. And so not only could I go and, you know, teach students to do a character design or a comic strip, but now I could say, hey, I've got this new book, you know, I can come do a reading for you if you pre-order 25 copies of my book through the tattered cover, and I'll come for free, you know. And uh, as a self-publisher, that actually the 25 books made, uh, you know, a decent difference uh, to my pocketbook, whereas if I was traditionally published and you're only getting like a, um, a share of the royal, uh, like 10% of the cover, and then you got to split that with your agent, you know, selling 25 books isn't really anything. <laughs> so, but that, that helped me quite a bit. And, um, and then I, I, the other thing at conference that came up, you know, I had mentioned this is the first picture book. Well, the reason there's a reason for that. I was never really inspired to do stuff for kids until my son came around. But as he got older, uh, I wanted to write stuff that was geared towards him. You know, he's the one that inspires me. And um, at one of these conferences, I had a... a uh, Critique, uh, portfolio critique with Dan Yaccarino, who did a keynote at our conference about how every opportunity he got was from saying yes. Even if he knew, didn't know if he could deliver, he would say yes, and then he'd get opportunities and, you know, whether it be picture books or animation or film or whatever, he always said yes. So, when he was doing uh, my portfolio critique, he ran up and uh, upon some pages that I, I just used to fill in because I didn't have enough picture book art. I, I had some art from a graphic novel I was working on, and he just stopped. And he's like, well, what do you see yourself doing in five years? And I'm like, well, this is, this is the last graphic novel that I'm working on. I'm just you know, going to transition to doing all picture books because I'd like to get published by a trade publisher. Um, and uh, like I'll tell you what, all the children's book trade publishers that have published picture books have published graphic novels at this point as well. The only difference is that they're getting inundated with submissions for picture books, but there's not as many for graphic novels because of how much work goes into it. And uh, so that got me thinking, and, and I talked to him about my whole career and that I was teaching comics. And he's like, well, clearly this this is something that you were born to do. 
like, you know what, he's right. Because when I think of stories, I always think of them in panels. And so I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm going to start doing some comic or uh, some graphic novels for kids. Then he gets up and does his keynote. And he's like, he said, he said yes to everything except graphic novels because you'd have to be crazy to do that <laughs> amount of work. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. So he gave me career advice to do exactly the one thing that he wouldn't do in his career, the one thing he wouldn't say yes to. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, um, I, I was able to, uh, through the uh, teachings of SCBWI, figure out how to finally sign with an agent. Then, with the encouragement of my critique group, fire that agent for not doing his job. <laughs> and then, again, fortunately, I signed with another agent, um, and uh, which my first agent was was like very hands off. He's like, oh yeah, this is good, and then he'd just send it out. Um, but I, I was like, well, something's not right, you know, and granted, I wasn't happy with how few editors he sent my book to, but also I wasn't really getting any meaningful response. And so I was like, well, maybe I need an, an agent that's a little more editorial. And a lot of my critique group were sharing stories about how awesome and editorial their agents were to make their submission packets better. And so I wanted to show you um, some of the things that uh, my new agent, we just finished this pitch packet for um, this project that's called 4-4, which I originally put it as a horror genre, but she made me change it because I think that may scare some editors off. Um, a nerdy Chinese girl sees visions of her impending death and must break the curse or die on her 13th birthday. And then uh, comp titles. I'm aiming for a style that's artfully cartoony, like this was our pact, as the story would have magical realism of Pashmina, but a darker, uh, slightly darker vibe like Goosebumps or Coraline, and cultural family interactions and Asian protagonists such as Stargazing. When 12-year-old Eugenia Chini is hit in the head with a sneaker during PE, she starts getting unnerving visions of her impending death and the death of everyone she cares about by her upcoming birthday on April 4th. Eugenia has never celebrated on her actual birthday, 4-4, because of mom's belief that in the weird, oh, I should have put quotes there, Chinese superstition that four is an unlucky number. Eugenia doesn't believe in such things until visions get worse, and then uh, she might have to do something that she really hates, admit mom is right. An unseen force is sending Eugenia messages through her comic artwork, and she needs to figure out what is happening, and fast. Her birthday is just nine days away, and if it's cursed after all, everyone's life depends on it. And then... Uh, so one of the things that, that the children in the children's book industry that's a little bit different is that you don't actually finish your pages because if you've like completed a 300 page graphic novel and it's fully done, then they know, know that you're not going to be willing to go back and change anything. <laughs> um, these are probably a little bit tighter than most of the dummy pages I've seen. This is cool. So this is what you actually submit to yeah, yeah. publishers. I just figured it would be neat for you guys to kind of see the back end of, and then any you know these are the few finished pages. So I did like four finished spreads. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I wanted to make sure to to color them fully at the point that she has her first vision. So this is like when she finally if she gets hit in the head. I can't wait to find out what happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I did about not quite 30 pages. This comes out to about 26 pages to kind of give you a good idea of uh, you know, how the, my narrative style, character consistency, um, 
character interactions and what their voices are like. And, and I did all this on Procreate because I know you guys are doing Procreate, so you can lob Procreate questions at me. But I just don't have it connected. So those of you at home, I'm sorry. I won't be able to show anything live on Procreate <laughs> my iPad. We'll figure that out. Yep. We're new to this. Yep. So, yeah, I anyway. think we'll see what it actually looks like, which actually is And great to know that you don't have to have a final product. Before you. Right. Well, and, and that was something I didn't know. And I think why this first go around took so long. Because if you look at all the different projects I have, so this is actually, this story started off as a story called Olfactory Memory. And then I um, did a, um, a uh, manuscript critique with uh, an editor who asked for a full manuscript and then when I sent it to her she, she said that you know this is great but it's like so many different stories together you should take out you know I don't I don't think it should be 1981 and this it originally was like the, the visions were triggered by um, my character's sense of smell and uh, so I threw all that out uh, and, and basically focused on the heart of the story, which she, she felt like was really timely because it was basically the, the, the heart of the story is, well, it's actually in the pitch packet, so I, I don't have to paraphrase it. It's, uh, where is it? Where did I take it out? Well, maybe I took it out. But anyway, it's, it's about basically not caring for other people instead of yourself in, in cases where, you know, people's lives depend on it. And that was, that's the lesson that she learns through the course of my story is that she can't ever change the outcome of her visions. And then when it actually happens, she is able to change her actions to be a little bit more helpful than selfish. And that changes like the outcome of of what she thinks is her fate, you know. And uh, yes. Well, it, and it's it's something that uh, you know this this uh, editor, you know, because the pandemic had already started, felt like was an important message. Is that you know people need to just stop thinking of themselves and you know what they want and in, in in when it's for the larger good. In this case, it's her family, you know, uh, and her friends too. So, uh, but, so this, uh, so this project I rewrote three times. <laughs> the first few times I wrote like the complete graphic novel and both times it was about 160 pages long or maybe a little longer than that. But then, um, but then uh, my agent said, you know, there's too many panels on each of these pages. And I'm, I was still thinking like a self-publisher, you know, I got to print a shorter book to save myself money. And so as I started stretching it out, um, I, didn't, I didn't totally rewrite it this last time, but I rewrote the synopsis, and, uh, which is also in my pitch packet at the end there. Um, and, but I didn't bother to completely rewrite everything. I just rewrote like, well, I rewrote more than the pages that I drew, but the other project that had been soliciting around that I showed you some art from was the Salem Charter Academy, which is, uh, I completely wrote as well. So this, this one is a uh, uh, hundred and, did I take away the page count on this one? I think it was like 167 pages. And then I started writing the evil twins, which are characters in Salem Charter Academy. So this ends up being a prequel um, about a student election that they accidentally got cursed into being in. And then uh, they agree to be in it, but then they end up running against each other and they're conjoined twins. 
Um, awesome. Well, this is great. Let's get um, Thomas. Do you have some? Yeah. Um, Stan, if you want to just scoot your chair a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm in the frame. <laughs> right. Hi, I'm Thomas. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, all right. So, uh, first of all, um, in your time uh, as an artist, how have you seen the culture of comics sort of evolve and how do you see that continuing to evolve in the future? Um, I've seen it evolve quite a bit, actually. Um, you know, when I started, um, getting involved in comics in the late 80s, comic books, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the things that I was inspired by were, you know, alternative and underground comics like, you know, R. Crumb, Harvey P. Carr, uh, Bob Fingerman. Um, and, and, you know, most of, you know, the, that part of the industry as well as the mainstream part of the comic industry, the superheroes, mm -hmm. they seem to be all very male centric, you know, and uh, um, and then and then of course, um, as I got into maybe my early twenties or so, then you started to see a lot of um, reprinted and translated collections of manga mm -hmm. at your Borders and Barnes and Nobles. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about that is like for years and years, the mainstream comic book industry said, like, why don't you do comics for, uh, you know, female readers? And they're like, well, you know, we, we've already tried it and it just doesn't work. You know, take a look at it. 80% of our readers are male, 20% are female. And then when uh, the manga hit the shelves, the demographic of the readers were 60% female, 40% male. It's like, okay. Yeah. So you really didn't do your research. <laughs> yeah. You didn't really try. So that's one thing that's definitely changed is there's a lot more comics, um, even within the mainstream publisher, uh, comic, adult comic publishers mm -hmm. for, um, for females. But, but then you, you're also seeing a lot of more kids comics as well. Mm -hmm. And that actually kind of started because of uh, one of my uh, con friends, uh, Raina Telgemeier. Way back in the day, Smile used to be, uh, I used to buy new issues from her at uh, San Diego Comic Con. She was like photocopying them and saddle stitching them. And then I, you know, walk to the other end of the small press pavilion and buy my issues of smile that I didn't have yet. And little did I know that eventually, after she got the contract to illustrate the graphic novel version of the Babysitter's Club, that uh, they were going to publish Smile and that was going to be this big ground moving thing that actually caused all these uh, uh, trade publishers to consider doing graphic novels for kids. And it's still pretty early and, and you know, I think that publisher as well as Macmillan's first, second imprint have been doing this for a while, um, have been doing uh, graphic novels for kids for a while, but now you're starting to see all the other imprints over the past five years or so um, open up uh, their graphic novel imprints as well. So that's something that's changed quite a bit um, as well. Awesome. Um... What kind of advice would you give to someone who is looking to sort of become a part of that comic culture? Would you recommend like conventions or is there anything else? Um, you say? I think conventions are good just to see what other people are doing for sure. I mean, the one thing that I've kind of gotten out of the habit of doing over these last, gosh, was it 20 years now? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is, is uh, networking with other creators, you know? You know, in my presentation, I talk about having to figure out a way of making money at the convention and then that doing commission zombie characters got to be so lucrative that I was just chained to the table. I couldn't I couldn't network anymore. I was just sitting there trying to finish drawings and then inevitably 
taking them home and, and doing them at home and mailing them out to the people I couldn't finish them for. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, the next time I actually physically go to a convention again, my presence may be very different than the last time. Last time I was at a convention, I was selling zombie characters and drawing them at the table. And, uh, and you know, sadly, it, it's like something that, I mean, it's fun for me, but it's also physically difficult, like drawing. Like I think at uh, my second uh, Walker Stalker Con, which is a Walking Dead convention, I ended up, um, and this was like a year where it was like five below zero, we're in Chicago. And um, uh, the first, there's this only a two day convention. The first day I wasn't even there. My sales assistant was running the booth and taking commissions and taking photographs of people. And, um, and I, when I finally showed up, because uh, I was at my grandma's funeral, unfortunately, um, it was like five hours into the, the convention and she already had like 50 commissions waiting for me <laughs> there. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, um, so yeah, as great as those are, and as lucrative as those are, I, I just feel like, um, yeah, I, I need to kind of pivot, focus to something that's not, not so physically demanding on me. Um, and something that has the ability to uh, make money beyond what uh, the, the convention, you know, mm -hmm. that, that has a chance of giving me residuals. And then, you know, I always describe to people that getting my stuff published is, is a lot uh, like winning the lotto, you know. It's difficult. It probably isn't going to happen. There's a lot of investment into it that you m I might not see back. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, being a stockbroker, I think of it this way. So um, you have to diversify your income streams. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, if you put all of your eggs in the speculative, creating your own graphic novel and trying to get published basket, um, then you might end up bankrupt and starve to death. <laughs> So you need to have something that's making you money on the other end. So right now, I've been able to do that with uh, teaching and with caricature gigs, you know, birthday party, corporate events, um, things like that. So just, you know, if you're doing art, I, I would recommend that number one, figure out what you really like about it. So for me, you know, it was clear to me that being a storyteller is what I want to do. It's just too much time and effort that goes into it to just trying to chase what's hot in the market right now. Um, because for me, even if I spent all this time and effort illustrating a, a, a graphic novel that didn't really sell, the, the process of making it is still rewarding to me. And so um, if I was depending on it for money, that could kill me. <laughs> and and I, I feel like no matter what you do for your uh, creative energy, if that's your passion, um, don't lose your passion no matter what. So don't lose your passion at the expense of trying to make it your career. So, I mean, I always, I always use this analogy. You know, how many of your parents are... Um, are passionate about golf. <laughs> now, how many of them are on the PGA Tour? Well, they don't play golf because they're making money out of They're playing golf because they're passionate about it. And they're making time in their lives to make sure that they keep happy. And I think that's kind of the way that everyone should look at their art. So if by doing it as a career, you take away the happiness of, of doing your passion, then maybe that's not what you should do for your career. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, that's super interesting. Um, kind of jumping back to what you said about storytelling being yeah. like your main thing. Um, would you see storytelling and visual art as sort of like inherently entwined or 
Um, would you consider them kind of separate things? And have you ever struggled to sort of bridge? In, in my own them? mind, yeah. But I, I also see understand that storytelling happens in different ways for different people. Um, and they're all unique media. And, and it's, I think every time that you see like a book that got made into a movie or a book that got made into a comic or a comic that got made into the movie, you always have people say, well, the original, the source was faster or whatever. Well, that's just an example of how stories don't necessarily have the capacity to occupy more than one media sometimes. Mm -hmm. They were made for a particular medium and you can tell. Mm -hmm. And then when they were, they try to make a version of it. So my, my favorite example is uh, uh, the, the book that became Blade Runner was uh, the android stream of electric sheep, <laughs> uh, which honestly, I like Blade Runner better. <laughs> but I didn't know that it came but one books, of the comic so. book publishers felt like, um, you know, what we really need to do is, is a, uh, um, to honor Philip K. Dick's original vision. So they did a comic book series that was word for word. Uh, uh, do the android stream of electric sheep and put all the text in these comics and made a comic. It was the most unreadable thing. Yeah, ever. that sounds. <laughs> very, very, very. But that was their constraint. You know, we want to make sure that you don't lose any of the original story. But then, if you've ever read any of his stuff, he jumps around a lot. There's not a lot of chronology, and so half of the time the illustrations were just very loosely related to the text. And that made it very difficult for me to read. So. All right. Um, oh, goodness. Uh, oh, OK. What, what surprised you most about becoming a full-time artist after working at such like a very traditional job as a um, stockbroker? The, the thing that surprised me the most was that it was my income stream was more steady. So as a stockbroker, I was fully commissioned. So I never knew what I was going to make from month to month. But the only difference is that, and, and I took a lot of good things out of that industry. You know, I was um, a salesperson. I was dealing with clients. Um, I had to read lots of contracts because it's a highly litigious industry. And those are all things that I used as an artist. So, you know, when I, um, when I had a, a new client as an artist, you know, I try to put myself in their shoes to figure out how I could address their needs and put them, you know, make them uh, uh, confident that they can do business with me. And one of the things was preparing an artist contract. So if I was competing for a job, I always had, I would ask them, you know, do you have a contract or I can send you what I typically have, even if I've never done it before. Mm -hmm. I just use like a contract template and then uh, Jerry rig it for the specific <laughs> situation that I was dealing with, um, just so that they knew what their expectations were. I knew what my expectations were and everything was spelled out because um, one of the things that I hear from every artist friend is they've, um, without fail, they've all been stiffed. They've all been screwed over somehow, some way. You know, I've been doing this now since full time since 2007. I've never been stuffed and I've never had, I mean, even if I wasn't thrilled with a client, um, they never, you know, because everything is spelled out. If they asked me to do more work. They never, you know, sneezed at that. They would just pay me more money and say, oh, well, okay, let's redo this or let's, you know, revise this because it's all spelled out. Um, what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> um, actually, I'd like to I kind digress. of add another question jumping off okay. of that. Um, would you recommend that people who are looking to like go to art school um, also take sort of like accounting or more classes that are more about the technical side of it um, as a business? I don't, I don't know if I would necessarily say that. I mean, I was able to do it because I'm both right and left brains, which um, not everyone is. But I think that really helped me. And, and I have to say that going to school and doing something that didn't come naturally to me, because art came naturally to me. I'm pretty much self-taught. 
but um, um, that ended up um, uh, helping me because, I mean, to be honest with you, my worst part of my GPA in school was in my accounting classes. <laughs> but that's because so much of it is, so like the first couple of years is all logic and then you get to governmental and tax accounting and it's all about just who lobbied your elected representatives to pass <laughs> stupid laws to benefit their their business, you know. So it's rote memorization, which I'm horrible at. But but the good thing about it is that now you know when when you're more times than not, if you're an artist, you're also um, a small business person. Mm -hmm. You're running your own business, and so I can I can do my own taxes. Uh, I, and I guess since I went to school and saw like the jobs that were available coming out of school that thank goodness I didn't get, <laughs> um, that I never want to do anyone else's taxes. So <laughs> you couldn't pay me enough. Um, oh, oh, I remember what I was getting to you with, with <laughs> the previous question. The thing that surprised me was that um, um, the, uh, so, when, when uh, I was a stockbroker, I had no idea whether the companies I was recommending that my clients buy stock in, if they're, you know, their chief financial officer was lying on their statements or they're shipping bricks all over the place. But when I'm talking to a prospective client about hiring me, I know exactly what I can or can't do. I mean, just like Dan Yaccarino, you know, there's sometimes situations where oh, I haven't done this before, but I have this skill, this skill, this skill, and I can learn this on YouTube. <laughs> and then I'll say yes to something like that. So, um, but, but I feel like I have a lot more control over my life now that I'm doing uh, this. Plus, plus, you know, fortunately for me, it does dovetail into my passions. Mm -hmm. So I'm still able to spend uh, a good amount of my work time each week doing what my passions are. Uh, whereas I, I wasn't always able to do that. And it, it is a balance too, because I think there was a time where I was teaching a lot and the majority of my income was from teaching and then I didn't have any time to work on my own personal projects. And then I had to, ended up having to go on sabbatical from teaching because I felt like it was holding me back. Um. Very important. Do you have more questions, Thomas? Uh, I mean, I, I have a whole long list of questions. So Sorry, I, I, I blathered on. I, I, Sorry, I, I, I need to answer. Yeah. 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 I do want to make it up to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a characteristic. <laughs> I'm a I don't have a characteristic, but yeah. Um, I'm actually, uh, one of my careers I'm looking forward to, like, look, looking into is uh, children with illustration. So, uh -huh. so that we share that as well. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice more of the illustrating side. I don't really have a writer's brain. So I was wondering if you knew if like you had any advice for that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean you one of the things that you can do to build your portfolios for children's book art is do your own versions of the illustrations for classic children's books. Um, they, sometimes they've got challenges and things like that. Like uh, the SCBWI one year did a like a red riding hood challenge and so we all did our own versions of uh, a segment of a story from Red Riding Hood but I think that's that'd be a good idea of trying to do that I don't I don't know if I mean if it's just for your portfolio maybe you could do that with other books too that aren't like in the public domain <laughs> um, I mean I and, and honestly if you do that um, uh, like, um, you know, you can tag the writers too. Maybe they'll like them. You never know. <laughs> like, I've done fan art for middle grade novels that I've read that I'm like, oh, this is so good. I had to be, I was inspired to draw a scene or a character from their story. And, you know, the authors always appreciate that. And who knows if the authors see them, maybe they're. Agents or editors see it too. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, the, the one thing that I've learned is that you just like there's there's so many opportunities out there to 
uh, make an impression um, to connect with people. And especially now with the internet and social media, you know, everyone is, for the better or worse, uh, you know, everyone can connect with each other. So I think that, uh, you know, being really internet savvy is a good thing um, to advance your career, especially in a creative career. Um, but uh, uh, just be careful what you say out there as well. <laughs> Or what you what you share out there because it can sink you as well. Just like what was the other than like obviously just terrible well, to say. You know, I think a lot of people see their social media platform as this is me and this is all sides of me. Um, I don't necessarily see it that way because I think you know. Um, I mean, if, especially if you're not really eloquent about uh, expressing opinions, and your opinion may be, you know, subjectively right, but if you say it in a certain way, then you may offend people that are decision makers that could have been opportunities for you that are no longer opportunities for you because, you know, you kind of burn that bridge then. Would you recommend like a, a professional account versus a personal account kind of thing maybe with that? Sir? No, because even if you've got a personal yeah. account, Anyone it becomes your that. professional account. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, if you get do a job interview, they're going to look at all of your social media accounts, yeah. you know, to make sure that uh, they're not hiring a loose cannon or something, <laughs> um, you know, or someone that's going to create problems for them. So I, I would say, uh, you know, keep your personal stuff extremely personal. Because <laughs> most social media is exactly that, you know. Uh, I, I know on some social media you can limit the, the public nature of certain things, but especially in the industry that I am, all the editors and art directors and agents hang out on Twitter. There's no private part of Twitter, really, you know. I mean, unless you're already a part of a group that you're, you know, you have a private chat going on or something like that. Uh, but that's about it. That's not how people use Twitter, though. <laughs> not really. You know, follow the hashtags. Yeah. Any appropriate questions? <laughs> Kind of about the text. Do you just like add the text and then just put it in like a box and fit it in however you can fit it, or do you do it a different like way? the design, the visual design of the text? Yeah, the yeah. Text? So, so that was one of the things I was hoping to show on my iPad. But you know, the the general. So what I'll do is uh, I'll actually um, do the uh, the text first. That way I can make sure it's mm -hmm. big enough. I, you know, and sometimes you get verbose and you are not honest about how much space you're going to have left to draw in the panel. So put the text in, you can address that as well as make sure that things are being read in order that you want them to in the high flow work. So I do that first, and then I start drawing uh, just stick figure versions of the characters because I know they're general shapes. and. You know, that only takes me maybe two or three minutes per panel. And if it's not working, no big deal. I haven't gotten emotionally invested in it. This is the same way I worked when I was working in traditional media as well, pencils and brush pens and things like that. And then, uh, and then I'll start adding details. Now, the good thing about Procreate is you can do them on separate layers, of course. And so, you know, you can always end up with a really clean finished product because you don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, I did the pencils too dark and they wouldn't erase out. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, there's ways of addressing that too, you know, so a lot of my friends still work traditionally. Then when they scan their work, they just, you know, use uh, certain filtering things on Photoshop to clean up, clean things up before they start adding colors and things. So you still know a lot of people who hand draw and then scan it. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, depends on the project. Like, there's still one project that I'm working on that uh, um, I plan everything digitally, and then I print it out on uh, 11 by 17 paper, and then I actually light box everything onto watercolor paper. Because what I really wanted to do is when this book came out is maybe do it like a traveling art show. So I wanted the original art to look really close to what the finished published art looked like. You know. Just sort of that traditionally? Uh, half and half, actually. Mm -hmm. So like I, I assembled everything. So like the line work is traditional media, um, at least for the first half of the book. Well, actually, most of the book like the backgrounds, the watercolor washes are all traditional. Um, but then I assembled them all in, in Photoshop. And uh, so so I each each page is maybe three or four, at least three or four separate drawings that I did. And then I kind of sandwiched them all together in Photoshop. So I scanned each piece. Thanks so. for the process. <laughs> uh, by the last half of the book, everything everything was um, black and white. So I, I actually selected colors in Photoshop. Well, um, we are at 604 and I know some people have parents waiting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, like, yeah, appreciate it. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you too. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Sorry to yeah, have a chance actually, to answer more questions. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually a big comic nerd. Yay. I've been oh, good. Every year. I, I refuse to change, stop calling it over Comic Con, but <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's. So. You know why they changed it though, right? Yeah, it was the... Uh,